Hey there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship with a video about specification by example in Java. You may have heard of specification by example. It's a technique for essentially eliciting precise requirements from our customers, from non-technical stakeholders, using examples, using tests essentially to drive out the detail of exactly what they're expecting the software to do. To illustrate specification by example, I'm going to use um, a, a domain, um, a problem um, that I've used in previous videos for the CD warehouse. So we've got some very vague requirements from our customer, a very short description there about our CD warehouse. Customers can buy CDs, search on the title and the artist, etc, etc. And I've parsed that and essentially broken it down into what I think are the four main user stories here. Buying a CD, searching for a CD, receiving a batch of CDs into the warehouse and reviewing CDs. And for each of these user stories, I've thought about different scenarios, different test scenarios that I think the software might need to handle. So I've built this test list. A test list is a pattern described in Kent Beck's book, Test Driven Development by Example. And I find it a very useful exercise to go through a problem and just enumerate, just list out all the test cases I think I would need to pass to solve that problem. And that is a step forward. There's a bunch of thinking that goes on there, but there's still a lot of ambiguity in these test lists. There's, it's very open to um, interpretation as exactly what is supposed to happen in each of these scenarios. To pin this down, what I could do is I could go find my customer and we go, go into a meeting room or find a quiet space somewhere and spend some time essentially driving out a shared, precise understanding of exactly what we're expecting to happen in each of these scenarios. And we want to capture that in a way that both our, my customer can understand, who potentially as a non-programmer, but also in a way that I could then reuse to, to drive real automated tests. So both human readable and potentially machine readable in some format. Now, one application that most business users are familiar with when it comes to capturing structured or tabular data is Microsoft Excel. So what I've done is I've taken my customer into a room and we have captured um, examples for each of these scenarios in a spreadsheet. So the spreadsheet essentially captures all the scenarios for this particular user story by a CD. And for each scenario, I've created one worksheet. We'll see uh, the, uh, near the top here, we've got a nice friendly description of the scenario in a very popular format these days, given when then. Given is the setup for our scenario, when is the action that we're testing, and then describes the outcomes that we're expecting to get. So we tend to start with that so the customer can have a think. And then once we've got that, we start, we go through and we start asking questions, looking through and going, what a CD, what CD? Not in the top 100, well, what is its chart position? Stock, well, what stock? The customer's card, well, what is the customer's card? And so on and so forth. So parsing that out, and then we start to fill in those gaps with real examples, ideally taken from the real world, so they, they, they represent real domain data, real examples. And we can capture those. We've, I've captured below here in a table the actual examples in terms of inputs and expected outputs. So, for example, we're buying a copy of So by Peter Gabriel, a great album, by the way. Its chart position is 101. We have 10 copies in stock. Our price for it is $9.99, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The payment is accepted. It's in stock. At the end of that, the stock should go down by one, so we should be left with nine copies. The customer's card should have been charged £9.99, and we're sending a chart notification about the sale of that particular album. Album. We've got, just to, just to ensure that there's no ambiguity, we've, we've captured a couple of examples there. Just so that, because the more examples we see, the, the easier it is to spot the patterns, basically. So what we've got there, in terms of um, data, is something that we could use to drive a real JUnit test. And that's exactly what I've done. Now, we'll talk a little bit about how you can automate this process later. But for now, what I've done is I've literally copied and pasted things into a JUnit automated test. So you'll see I've got a parameterized JUnit test here. And the parameters of my test match, exactly match the inputs and outputs from my customer test. So they're an exact match. I've followed a convention to do this in terms of naming. 
and there's a bit of type inference going on there. I've looked at the data and go, well, that's, that can be a string, that can be an int, and so on. So there's a little bit of interpretation going on, but it's based directly on the data. And then I have literally copied and pasted the data from each of those examples into my automated test, into my parameterized test. So they're in, they hopefully are in exactly the right order here and they're of exactly the right type to match these parameters that are set here. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. I've got a setup method here that's going to be reused, as you'll see. And the given part of our given when then is set up here. So I've got a bunch of, uh, I've used Mockito to create these stubs to return some of the data from things that don't exist yet. So I can work outside in. These are going to be external dependencies, so there'll be more code to write once I've got CD working. Um, but for now, I'm going to fake it until I make it. Um, and also because some of my tests are going to be about messages that get sent to these external systems, as you'll see. But they need to return some test data. So at this point, they're playing the role of stubs. We set up my credit card. We've got our payments interface being injected, our payments object being injected into a credit card object, which is going to be used to process the payment. That was a design decision I made. Then we set up our CD with the title, the artist, the stock, the price, and the chart position, which is going to be returned by that stub for charts. And this object here is null. This is just a dummy, basically, for market intel. Because this album is not in the charts, um, we don't need to know um, what our competitors are charging for it. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then we perform the action. That's the when part of our given when then. And the bottom here, I've got three actual test methods, one for each of those outcomes or for each of those outputs from my customer's example. So the first one is where we're saying, well, the stock should finish equaling this. The second one is about a message that should be sent. In other words, how much did we charge when we talk to the payment system? And of course, we check that we're also processing the using the right credit card. And then finally, are the charts notified of the sale? was the right chart notification sent. So this is all the data that we're pulling in from our customer example into our parameterized test. And there's a lot going on here, but ultimately when you get to the bottom, it's three tests. Let's run those tests, see what happens. If you would like, please to... No, it doesn't know. Okay, let's run them from there. There we go. Nice, fast running test. Now I've got a bunch of tests here, as you'll see. Now, if we quickly go back to the spreadsheet, in the process of having this conversation with the customer about our happy path, they remembered something. And this is the, the sort of the power of, of using this technique directly with our customers. They remembered that they have a price guarantee. If any album is in the charts, in the top 100, we um, guarantee to beat our lowest competitor's price by one pound. So we came up with another, we added another scenario essentially for albums that are in the top 100. And in those cases, even though we charge 9.99 for this album, that's our price, our lowest price competitor charges 7.99. Therefore, we're gonna charge our customer 6.99. So if the, if the album is in the top 100, the pricing is different, there's different pricing logic. So we added some scenarios as we were having this conversation, and that's the power of this technique. And in getting around these examples, um, we can have these conversations and explore what, what really needs to happen. And the customer will, and so will we, will start to, to think of things or notice things or remember things um, that when we were talking in the kind of abstract, when we were talking in this kind of way, didn't really occur to them until they actually saw an example and thought, oh, but what if it's in the charts? Um, so we added that as part of this process. So we've probably saved ourselves quite a bit of time here. This was an important requirement, as it turns out. And that's the power of this technique. It's also an opportunity to manage the complexity of our requirements and the complexity of our software. So we can kind of negotiate at this point. If we find that, um, that a user story has dozens and dozens of scenarios that we need to handle, this is an opportunity to start simplifying that and having a, a, a kind of a 
not a debate, but a negotiation with the customer. Maybe, well, maybe if we don't give the user that option, then that's going to remove a whole bunch of scenarios that we don't need to handle anymore. So how could we simplify the design of the software to make it, in terms of behavior, uh, much more straightforward? And that's really, this is really where that conversation should be had. And rather than trying to build it and then discovering that it's too complicated, it's going to take too long, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a very, very powerful technique. That can, if done well, lead us directly to automated tests. So it can dr drive that out outside in TDD process. My tests are all fast running unit tests. So external dependencies, I've used stubs and mocks, for example. There are also parts of the design that I don't want to think about yet. Um, and therefore, I've, I've used stubs or mocks so I can just sort of fake it until I make it. So it's true outside in de design. And one scenario at a time, what I've done is I sort of work my way in end-to-end, -end, driving an end-to-end -end design in a test-driven way for each of these scenarios until we've completed an internal end-to-end -end design for all of the customer's tests. Um, so we're kind of taking vertical slices through our architecture rather than doing all of the, the front-end stuff and then all the middle tier and et cetera, et cetera. We're actually doing vertical slices like, well, we'll do the front-end and the controller and the middle tier and et cetera for this particular scenario, this particular uh, example. And then we'll move on to the next example so that when we're finished, we've got something that works end to end, but all the way through, we're building slices that work end to end. So it's a good way of kind of driving design in that way. And also something that a team can organize around delivering slices of features end to end. So everybody that needs to be involved in that in terms of programming and database and, and web design and um, security and etc 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 needs to be involved so you organize the team around delivering you organize the team around delivering these these outcomes end to end rather than everyone sort of going off into their own silo and doing their own thing so it is a powerful technique you will see we have a bunch of tests now each this is just the convention that i followed each test fixture matches a particular scenario and they're all in their own little package there that identify what's, what, what user story we're talking about here. So we've got a bunch of them here matching. There's the one for an album that's in the top 100. So slightly different to them. So a bit of duplication here that I might choose to remove from the tests. We'll see later. So it's an ongoing process. It's TDD. There's more refactoring to do and et cetera, et cetera. And no doubt when we finally deliver this working software to their customer, um, and for them to use, they'll have, they'll have changes they want anyway. That always happens. Um, a word of warning about this whole process, though. First of all, customer tests. Let's distinguish between customer tests, that's these things, and customer testing. You can automate a customer test. Indeed, that's exactly what I've done by copying and pasting data. You can automate a customer test, but you cannot automate customer testing or acceptance testing the customer has to do that they have to see it with their own eyes as it were experience it for themselves we now have test scripts that they can use to do that so that's a real plus in that respect they can go through these scripts and go yep that's exactly what we agreed so they can be useful for that and the other thing i'm going to mention is so i've done this kind of manually i've copied and pasted data etc cetera, etc cetera, into these test fixtures and that's quite a laborious process, and you'll be delighted to hear that there are tools that will do that for you. Um, for example, um, Fitness is a tool that, that allows you to capture data in multiple forms, including spreadsheets, but you can also capture it using wiki pages. So similar kind of thing, both customer readable and machine readable. And it can automatically pull in that data into parameterized automated tests. Um, Cucumber and, and other tools that are named after salad ingredients do a very similar thing. They will generate test fixtures for you based on the, um, the test examples that we've captured and based on our given when then description and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I could quite easily, if I were to devote a few hours to doing this, and I might even get around to doing it at some point, I could probably write a, a macro for, for Excel that will do that for me, that will generate the, the skeleton of a JUnit parameterized test using these tables like this, using the information on these, these worksheets. Um, so it can be done. And that takes out some of the donkey work for sure. But don't, don't get distracted. The real value in specification by example 
is having that conversation with our customer, getting around a, a projector or a, a laptop and, and actually going through each example and building that shared understanding, whether you're gonna copy and paste these or do it manually or whether you've got an automated tool is not really the point. What the point is, we drive out the, the precise details of exactly what the software is going to do using examples. And we do it in such a way that it could, those examples could drive automated tests. That's what we're gonna use them for. They can drive the test-driven design process. So that's specification by example. It is a powerful and useful technique. Um, it involves um, a lot of communication and it, it requires engagement from your customer. Um, and that's not always easy, but it really is worth it. Far more economical to, to, to get an hour of your customer's time to clear up any misunderstandings about the requirements than to deliver working software and then have to have that conversation again over change requests that are gonna cost a lot more. It's much, much simpler for me to just add a new column to a spreadsheet now than in two weeks time or however long it is to have to go back and actually change the software. So that's the real value of specification by example.